Hello, and welcome to another video about linear algebra. My name is Patrick Naylor, and I'm one of the instructors for Math 235, along with Graham Turner. This is the last video that I'll be producing this term, and it's a review video for the final exam. I made a post in Piazza asking what sort of topics you'd like to see, and I chose the ones that I felt were the most popular to answer here. Okay, so let's get started. By far the most requested topic was the multiple choice or multi-select questions. These are some of my favorite questions to ask because they really test whether you understand and have absorbed the material completely. As a result, they're pretty challenging questions, so you should really take your time with them. Don't think of these as just being multiple choice questions on a written exam. Because this is an online environment, these are more like the hard proof questions that you'd usually find at the end of a written exam. We've had a lot of questions about how to approach these and how to think about these, so I'm going to go through two of them today. I'll show you how I would think about them myself, and I'll give you some advice for how to tackle these on the final. Okay, so the first one is about quadratic forms. We're given a quadratic form, Q, and we consider the symmetric matrix, A, corresponding to Q. We need to identify all statements which must be true. If you want, pause the video and see if you can answer this for yourself before moving on. Something to point out right away is that you don't have to think about all of these in order. For instance, let's just look at the second one. If A is positive definite, then the eigenvalues of A are all positive real numbers. Since the determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues, counted with multiplicity, this means that the determinant of A is strictly positive. We can check this one off right away. All right, let's go back to the first one. What if A is negative definite? This means that all eigenvalues of A are strictly negative numbers. Does this mean that the determinant of A is negative? It seems like it should be, but it's actually not true in general. What if there are an even number of eigenvalues? Then the determinant is the product of an even number of negative numbers, and so it's positive. For instance, what if A is just minus the identity matrix? This statement is false. Moving on to the third one, suppose that A is negative definite. Is it true that the trace of A is negative? This one is true, and it's similar to the first one that we did. If all eigenvalues are negative, then since the trace is just the sum of those eigenvalues, the trace is also negative. So this statement is true. Lastly, the fourth one. Suppose that A is positive semi-definite. Must the determinant of A also be positive? In this case, all eigenvalues of A are greater than or equal to zero, but they can still be zero. If this is the case, then the determinant will be zero, which isn't strictly positive. For example, what if A is just the zero matrix? This matrix is positive semi-definite, but the determinant is definitely zero. And for good measure, let's just cross off the none of the above option as well. As you can see, when the statements aren't true, the examples I'm trying to think about are pretty simple. This is a good strategy in general. If you're not sure whether something is true, think about the simplest object which will satisfy the hypotheses of the question. Must it also satisfy the conclusion? Usually, a good start is the zero matrix or the identity matrix. Okay, moving on. Let's do another multi-select problem. This one is about orthogonal matrices, and you may remember it from the midterm. We suppose that P and Q are real n by n matrices, and we'll answer questions about the orthogonality of P and Q. Again, pause the video and try to do this on your own before moving on. All right, well, we won't jump around this time. Let's tackle the first one. We suppose that P and Q are both orthogonal matrices. Is it true that P plus Q is also an orthogonal matrix? You may remember that if P and Q are orthogonal, then P times Q is orthogonal, but that's not what we're asking here. Well, okay, what if P and Q just add to zero? If P is orthogonal, then minus P is also certainly orthogonal. So what happens if we just take 
q is equal to minus p. They would add to zero, which isn't even invertible, let alone orthogonal. So this statement is false. On to the second one. Suppose that p is orthogonal. Is it true that the norm of p of x is equal to the norm of x for any vector x in Rn? You may recognize this from the section on properties of orthogonal matrices. In fact, this is part of theorem 9.2.7. Orthogonal matrices always preserve norm, and we've used that a lot in this course. This statement is true. How about the third one? We suppose that the columns of P are orthogonal. Is it true that P is an orthogonal matrix? This seems like it ought to be true, but it's not. If the columns of P are orthonormal, then by definition, P is an orthogonal matrix. Here, however, they're only orthogonal. Well, what happens if P is just the zero matrix? The columns are orthogonal because their inner products are all zero, but as we noted earlier, the zero matrix definitely isn't orthogonal since it's not even invertible. This statement is false. Again, notice that I picked the simplest example that I could think of here. Lastly, the fourth one. We suppose that P squared is the identity and that P is symmetric. Is it true that P is orthogonal in this case? The answer here is yes. If P is symmetric, then since P squared is the identity, we get P transpose times P is the identity, which means that P is invertible and that P inverse is equal to P transpose. This is actually the very definition of an orthogonal matrix, so this statement is true. And for good measure, we'll check off the none of the above response too. Hopefully you've found the thought process here helpful. Once again, I recommend you think about the simplest examples you can come up with and try to use all of the characterizations of each object when you can. These questions are designed to test if you understand the relationships between all of the objects that we've studied in this course. Okay, so the next most requested topic was isomorphisms. I'm not going to do any problems here. Instead, I'm going to do a summary of what we've done in this course and what you can do to construct an isomorphism. If any of this seems unclear, check out the textbook to review or the practice problems and their solutions. So the question I want to answer here is, how do we construct isomorphisms? Let's just recall the language that we use. A linear transformation, T, from V to W is called an isomorphism if it is both injective and surjective. Moreover, if there exists some isomorphism between V and W, we will say that V and W are isomorphic, and we'll write V is isomorphic to W with the symbol there. So, what options do we have in order to find an isomorphism? The first, explicitly write down your favorite linear transformation and check, by hand, that it is injective and surjective. This is probably the most work, but if you know what map you want to use, or if you need to explicitly describe your isomorphism, this might be the way to go. Something you'll likely want to use here is a fact that we've used a lot in this course, which is that a linear transformation, T, is injective if and only if the kernel of T is the zero vector. The second option, which is probably my favorite, is to use linear extensions. If you can find, or you happen to already know, two bases for V and W, and they have the same size, then you can simply declare a linear transformation, T, to be the linear extension of the map which sends one basis to another. This describes an explicit isomorphism as long as the bases have the same size. If you're unsure about why, try to prove it for yourself, or check out Graham's extra lectures on linear extensions. The third and final option is great when you don't need to describe the isomorphism between V and W explicitly. If V and W have the same dimension, then they're isomorphic. This is one of the main theorems from this section. In other words, find bases for V and W and just count. If they have the same size, 
then V and W are isomorphic. End of story. The only drawback here is that this does not provide you with an explicit isomorphism if you need it. Hopefully this summary is helpful for your studying. Don't be nervous about questions involving isomorphisms. Usually, they're really just questions about dimension in disguise. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in this video is diagonalization, since this was also a requested topic and because I think it's important. What is diagonalization good for? When are we allowed to do it? Again, let's recall the definition of diagonalizability here. A matrix A is diagonalizable if there exists an invertible matrix, S, such that S inverse times A times S is a diagonal matrix, let's say D. The first thing that I want to say here is that this is not always possible to do. A matrix is diagonalizable if and only if the algebraic and geometric multiplicities of the eigenvalues are the same, which is not true in general. Second, just because you have your favorite invertible matrix S does not mean that S inverse times A times S is a diagonal matrix. This is a very common mistake. The matrix S that we use here has to be pretty special. So we've done a few different kinds of diagonalization in this course, so I'll summarize them here so that you can see the differences and similarities between them. First, if we have a real symmetric matrix, A, then we know that we can orthogonally diagonalize A. In other words, we can find an orthogonal matrix, S, which diagonalizes A as above. Even if A is diagonalizable, we don't know that we can pick S to be orthogonal unless A is symmetric. Second, if we have a complex normal matrix, A, then we can unitarily diagonalize A. In other words, we can find a unitary matrix, S, which diagonalizes A as above. You should think of this as the analog of the real case. In fact, this theorem goes both ways. A complex matrix is unitarily diagonalizable if and only if it's normal. Lastly, if the matrix A isn't square, then we can't diagonalize it, strictly speaking. However, we do have the next best thing, which is the singular value decomposition. It's like diagonalization, but because A isn't square, the matrices on either side of A don't have the same size. You should really think about this as an analog of diagonalization. The very last thing I want to answer here is, why do we care about diagonalization at all? The answer is that it helps us understand linear transformations, since it makes it a lot easier to get a hold of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix. As some of you have been noticing on the last couple assignments, it's also very useful when it comes to dealing with powers of matrices. Well, that's all for now. I really hope that you've enjoyed this course. Linear algebra is a fantastic topic, and Graham and I have had a lot of fun talking to you, as best we could, on Piazza. Study hard, and good luck on the final exam.